So competence in housing. So post Grenfell, organisations, housing organisations in particular, have identified that the level of competency across both their internal staff and their supply chain might, and that's very generous, might be lacking. Low levels of assurance around this topic, Prost Grenfell, has led to a shift within housing from what I perceive to be unconscious incompetence, i.e. where they didn't know they didn't know it, to now a conscious incompetence. I think organisations now understand what they don't know. Responsible persons now acknowledge that assurance around competence is as critical as the traceability of the certification of the products they utilise in their buildings. A fantastic example of this is fire doors. I'm glad we've got someone from Gerda here today. Um, not many people realise that if you buy a third-party certificated door from an organisation like Gerda or Shell, and there are many more, if you don't install them with a third-party certificated um, fire door installer, the warranty on that product is completely invalidated. Now, what that does is it means you can't now pick and choose between having a third-party certificated product or a third-party certificated install. Those two things now go hand in hand to the extent that they will actually invalidate a warranty on the back of it. So competency criteria. All organisations must have an appropriate competency criteria for all fire safety services that it procures and indeed all of its internal fire safety services that it delivers itself, i.e. the fire safety manager or the works manager of some description. Previously, I talked to the ends of the earth about competency in fire risk assessments, and I'm going to talk about competency in fire risk assessments because it's so dear to my heart um, a little bit later. Don't worry, Simon, not too much later. Fire engineering. Many people are now engaging, social housing organisations in particular, are now engaging fire engineering services. Just because you're called a fire engineer, doesn't mean you're a competent fire engineer. You've got to identify your competency criteria even for the fire engineers you engage with. Um, fire alarms, your installers, the competency of the installers. Many social housing organisations would have procured um, fire alarm maintenance contracts well before Grenfell Tower ever happened and might not be considering whether they are third party certificated members of organisations like BAFE. The same will apply to emergency lighting systems and their installation um, and their maintenance and indeed the placement of individual lighting luminaires within the buildings that you operate in. Sprinkler systems. Every man and his dog that's got a bit of pipe work nowadays will claim and set up as a sprinkler um, installer. We're not going to call them sprinklers anymore. We like that. Um, but you don't need to be competent to install a sprinkler system. There's no legal requirement around the competency of a specifier installer of a sprinkler system. So again, you've got to start thinking about the competency criteria of those that you are going to engage to install those systems and indeed maintain them. And obviously doors, something that we've thought, thought about as a business for far too long probably, um, and the myriad of certification and competency around fire doors, which you'll hear a little bit about later the competency and the certification of those that supply, install and specify doors within your properties. So fire risk assessment. I would consider this in the fire safety industry to be the most widely acknowledged competency driven issue. There's no question about it. The race for the bottom around fire risk assessment, much like Lorna described about LABC and approved inspectors getting to the lowest common possible denominator, the lowest number of inspections. In fire risk assessments, we've seen the same thing. How quickly can someone do a fire risk assessment? How, how little time can they be on site? How quickly can they write those risk assessments up to deliver fire risk assessments with a competent practitioner for less than £100? I mean, business-wise, it doesn't make sense, but yet you can still buy them. Inside Housing um, did a Freedom of Information Act request to 180, uh, 128 councils, and this was in the last two months it was reported. Out of 128 councils who answered around fire risk assessment competency and who they engaged, only 26 used registered fire risk assessors to undertake fire risk assessments of their stock. And we're talking 18 months after uh, Grenfell Tower happened. 56 of them didn't know which is astonishing, isn't it? You don't know who's doing your fire risk assessments. Don't know whether the organisation is certificated. Don't know if the, the individual is on a register. We just don't know. 46 of them used a mixture. Thought maybe half of them 
needed to be competent, the other half, it doesn't matter. Um, a classic example of competence around fire risk assessments is if you've drived a red lorry for 20 years squirting water at things, it doesn't make you a competent fire risk assessor. And many organisations still perceive it to be a case that that does make you competent. 23 organisations admitted, well I say admitted, they were legally obliged to answer the question properly, 23 didn't use registered fire risk assessors. To undertake fire risk assessments in a portfolio pretty much identical to those of you that are in the room and those that you work with, which is astonishing because we've had competency criteria since 2011 in fire risk assessments. So when the Hackett report says we need to have a fire risk assessment competency criteria, we've had one for eight years. The problem is the responsible person in many cases simply don't know it exists or they don't care. There's no other way around it. Everyone knows that you've got to be third party certificated if you want to deliver a decent product. But it's not a requirement. Any of you can set up a fire risk assessment firm tomorrow. You don't need to have any legal license to do that. You don't even need to legally demonstrate competence. It doesn't say in the fire safety law you need to be competent to do a fire risk assessor. It's only inferred in documents like PAS 79 that you should be. It's up to the responsible person to ensure that they're only employing registered fire risk assessors or organisations. Products installers, the use of third party certificated products and organisations should not be undervalued should the housing industry commit to utilising third party schemes and third party products rather than things like committing to doing an annual fire risk assessment of their high rise, high risk residential buildings. Inside housing forced or at least in the press forced organisations to commit to doing an annual fire risk assessment but when only 26 of 128 are doing them with competent people, you get to the point where you think, what's the point of doing them annually? You're not going to pick up anything of any value. So third-party schemes and products for everything that's utilised, doors, cladding systems, um, emergency lighting, all these systems should be tested and you should have um, good traceability. Primary test evidence. Fire doors is the case in point at the moment. There are only, I believe, you'll probably tell me the number, but I think there's about five organisations that currently sell a fire door that has primary test evidence where it's been tested on both sides. Only five out of thousands of manufacturers. You can set up a door manufacturer at home, on your own, in a shed, go and get somebody's specification, create your own global certification. Although you haven't had it tested, you can say something similar was tested, therefore it's now globally assessed as being okay, and I can sell that to you. And without even knowing it, you've bought a product that isn't um, third-party certificated with primary test evidence. I'm sure Gerda will talk about that a little bit later. And frameworks which prioritise quality over price. Um, next week will be a launch of the Hyde Fire Safety Framework. And everybody that's on that framework that any housing organisation can procure um, has to have been vetted, has to be third-party certificated, and every product that goes through that has to be third-party certificated as well. It's a big commitment from Hyde, and I think it's fantastic that they're really leading the way in that. Um, managing fire safety in housing, as you well know, goes beyond passive and active systems in the build and refurbishment phase. I very much deal in the built environment. Obviously, I spend some time with organisations development. Development very much were the pin-up boys or, and girls of the housing industry when I worked for Affinity Sutton some seven years ago. And it's not necessarily the case now. The fire safety director and the project director for fire safety is the one who is getting the attention nowadays. It extends to providing employees and contractors with an understanding of the importance of the ongoing condition of systems so that they can monitor their effectiveness, which is critical. Often the most important element of the fire safety strategy is its management, which is very difficult in housing because there are no other sorts of buildings that I can think of where you'd have 150 people in it and absolutely no on-site management from a day-to-day -day, um, perspective. It wouldn't happen in a hotel. It wouldn't happen in a hospital. It wouldn't happen in a museum. But yet we let it happen in the places where statistically the most fires occur. Residents' reactions to fire safety requirements is critical, and the only way that you will get a resident to react in the way you want them to is to tell them how you want them to act. And social housing historically has been very poor at this with regard to fire safety. To be fair, I'd be guilty of that, actually, now I think back. Um, 
in, an, in a building where you have a stay put strategy, no fire alarm, you require the residents to do nothing in the event of a fire because you're not going to give them any warning. Therefore, how much information do you really need to give them if what you want them to do is nothing? The problem with that is, in the event of um, uh, extreme fires like we've seen with Lacanal, you rely on survival calls from the fire brigade, and those on the end of the phone may not know about the situation in the building or the specifics of your building. So nowadays, we need to be really engaging with residents and starting to talk to them about what stay-put strategy means to them, at what point they need to abandon the stay-put strategy should it be necessary, and many of you who will have waking watches in your buildings at the moment will be talking to them about a temporary simultaneous evacuation strategy, which is even more difficult um, to engage with residents around. Integration of fire safety into areas of the business not always identified as being a specific fire safety role is critical to ensuring this happens. Most organisations will have a fire safety manager or someone who is responsible for fire safety. They are probably the only person in the social housing organisation who's got any formal qualifications around fire safety. The only training we give to staff within social housing in particular is around the safety of them, fire safety wise, in the office in which they work generally. We talk to them about how to prevent fires in the office, who your fire warden is, where your own fire safety means of escape are, where, when you need to report a problem with the building's fire safety and things like that. We're all very guilty of doing that and the only reason we do that is because the law requires it. The law doesn't require you to tell a housing officer about fire safety hazards in the buildings in which they work that might affect the people that are living in the buildings. They only worry about affecting them as an employee while they're in the building for the short period of time while they do a, a survey or something of that nature. So the solution, we believe that training with wide acceptance in the sector, which represents best practice, is critical to improve safety in housing. It's lovely that Peter Gunnaway is sitting at the back there because a lot of what I'm about to say we talked about many, many years ago. I think it should have two key strands. The first strand should focus on the housing provider and the second should focus on those who, on behalf of the, the, um, uh, the housing provider, build, maintain or modify the residential premises. Those that you commit funds to, tier one contractors, tier two contractors, things like that, to go into your buildings to maintain them and modify them. So who's it for? The two strands with direct training at three key groups. SMT and board level, middle management, specifiers and project managers, and installers, site management or scheme managers within the two strands. So for those on the ground, teaching them about how to identify fire hazards that affect the occupants of the building, not them individually, which is what we're currently teaching them. Contributing to continuous risk assessment by regular review, monitoring, reporting of the fire safety standards within the buildings that they regularly visit. <coughs> Understanding residential properties within the individual's area of responsibility, and these may be simple and or complex premises, depending on the nature of housing within the individual's area of responsibility. So tailoring that training specifically to the areas that they would work in, be it sheltered housing accommodation, general needs accommodation, or other. So for those who are managing and specifying, it's important again that when they're on site they can identify fire hazards, but they need to have a good grasp of product traceability. This is something that I find most social housing landlords pretty bad at. Having a good grasp of installation competence and how to identify the competency of those doing installation. Having a grasp of passive fire safety systems so they know what good looks like and bad looks like. A good grasp of active fire precautions and understanding the limitations of their competence, which is absolutely crucial. So for those in senior management, understanding legal obligations placed upon them, accountability and liability associated with their day-to-day -day activity. Understanding of competency requirements across the range of activities undertaken and an appreciation for their cost. This stuff doesn't come cheap, unfortunately, which is probably why we're in the situation we're in. Understanding the process of cost to risk analysis and understanding the responsibility placed on their staff in roles which aren't necessarily fire safety specific. And lastly, understanding legacy issues and responsibility around those legacy issues, which is critical for tier one contractors and obviously the responsible person themselves.
Thank you very much. Thanks,